shall we rise up to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this Bible study tonight. We do bless your name because we know you are a great God and a wonderful God. Thank you, Lord, because we know that we are here today so we can hear from you. And we are praying, O oh Lord, you speak to every heart tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that you take these verses of scripture, these words in your word, and you apply it to every one of us, brothers and sisters, men and women, boys and girls, in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, O oh Lord, that today your word will enlighten us. Amen. Your word will give us real instruction. And your word will be very clear, very plain to every one of us. We'll be able to walk in the direction of the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Then we pray that our lives will not just be an isolated life. It will be a life that is influential in our communities. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see that tonight we come to our Bible study. And for those who are just joining us for Bible study, Bible study is the backbone of every Christian and in this church the Bible study as we have from week to week is the backbone of the church it's really unfortunate that there's some people that come to our church on Sunday and they are not here on Monday for a Bible study can I just give you a little bit of history a minute or two that the deeper life Bible church started with the Monday Bible study August of 1973 and since that time every Monday would you believe that every Monday we've been going from chapter to chapter and verse to verse and that is what has made deeper life what deeper life is and those who are not coming to the Bible study they are missing quite a lot would you please tell those who have not been coming that they develop their habit of coming to the Bible study and studying the Word of God. There are some things we are going to learn on Monday that you might not hear on Sunday. Not because we don't want to tell you, but because we go topical on Sunday, but we go ex expository on Monday. And we just go from chapter to chapter and verse after verse and that strengthens the believer. I pray that as you come tonight, you are going to be strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, but we're concentrating on verses 3 and 4 today. From verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be, may be one, may be without the word, one by the conversation of their wives, one by the character of their wives, one by the lifestyle of their wife, one by the comportment of their wives, one by the behavior of their wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be. That outward adorning of plating the air, or of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. These verses touch sensitive and essential areas of the life of christian women why shouldn't we just say it touches the sensitive area and the essential areas of the life of the christian by the way you know sometimes i wonder who is a christian when you see a christian how do you recognize a christian and when you think about it and put all the verses of scripture together where you have the christian i spell that word christian with a c c that means you are converted you see just coming to church doesn't mean that that fellow is a christian just holding the bible does not mean he is a christian or just you know i've been baptized in water i'm taking the holy communion and i'm doing this i'm doing that that doesn't make you a christian c is to be converted and there is no christian Christianity without conversion. There is no Christian without that conversion experience. H is to be holy. 
Uh, when, when you think about a Christian, he is converted. As a result of that conversion, he is holy. And without that age, without that holiness, it will be very, very doubtful that you have assurance of real, being a real Christian. It is that change of life. It is that transformation in your life that makes you to have the assurance, hey, I am a Christian. The Lord has touched my life. I am converted. And the practical evidence of that in my life is he has made me holy. Are you are righteous? You are righteous. You see, all the righteousness is gone. In fact, before that conversion experience, what did you do? You came to the foot of the cross. Or maybe you were standing up in the very presence of Christ and you confessed your righteousness. And then you held on to Christ the Redeemer. Christ the righteous one and then as the blood of Christ washed you and cleansed you all those things were washed away and you became righteous I you are instructed you know at the moment you become a Christian a real Christian there is this desire in you you want to learn the word of God. It says, and those that gladly received the word, they came together and they continued in fellowship and in the teaching, the doctrines of the apostles. You see, if you're a real Christian, the desire to learn the word of God will be there. The desire to know the word of God will be there as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. It is that instruction in the word of God that actually helps you to grow. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable unto doctrine for, and, and then it's uh, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect you're a christian that i means that you are instructed and every time you are coming back to the word every time you are coming back to the bible for more and more instruction in the word of god as your spiritual before you came to the lord you were carnal and you thought like a carnal man a carnal woman and you dressed like a carnal man a carnal woman and you related with people with that kind of carnality but you see when you become a christian there's that spirituality you understand now why if you're a real christian when you come to study the word of god that argument is gone that self-will is gone that you know stubbornness is gone i don't want to hear the word of god as a carnal person is not converted I don't want to be turned around by the word of God as a carnal fellow. It's not born again. It's not a Christian. You see, when you become a Christian, the S in that word Christian means you're spiritual. You know, the, the carnal things are gone. The natural things are gone. And the grace of God comes into your life. And there you are spiritual. And then T, it means you're teachable and transformed. You see, when you become a Christian, I want you to know. I want to know more about Christ, you are teachable. I want to know more about the word of God, you are teachable. I want to know more about the way that leads to heaven, you are teachable. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, we get to a church. I move around quite a lot. I travel quite, uh, you know, a number of times. And those of you are listening to me now on satellite, whether you are here in Nigeria or outside Nigeria, even outside Africa, maybe I've come to your place uh, this year. And, uh, you know, sometimes the pastor will tell me and he will say what are we going to do uh, you know this and they'll call them brother so and so it's just it's just tall in the church and you cannot bend him you cannot teach him you cannot instruct him and you might treat the whole bible to him in personal interaction and you know at the end he'll just say i'm sorry i don't accept that i tell those pastors but they're not christians how can somebody be a Christian and not be converted? How can somebody be a Christian and not be holy? How can somebody be a Christian and not be righteous? How will somebody claim to be a Christian and is not instructed and he doesn't want the instruction of the Bible? How can a person be a Christian and not be spiritual? How can somebody be a Christian and not be teachable? Teachable. You see, Christianity, when Christ comes into our heart, 
were willing to hear the word of God, learn the word of God, will become teachable. And, and you know, sometimes uh, I, you know, a, a pastor is speaking to me and he's saying, Pastor, uh, please, uh, you see the condition of the church here and you might see some of these women and you are wondering, Pastor, whether we are teaching the truth here or not. And then the pastor will say, with all my heart, with all the knowledge I have, I've endeavored to teach all the men and the women and the youths and everybody the word of God. And you might see some of those people sitting there before you, Pastor, and you say, have these not been taught? Why is it that they are like this in their appearance? They are like this in their comportment? Pastor, you know, there are some of those people who just leave them alone because if we were to concentrate on them alone, we'll never do any other thing. They are not teachable. I say, Pastor, tell them about Christianity. Tell them about being converted. Tell them about being born again. When you are born again, Christ comes into your heart and Christ rules and reigns your heart. And there's one thing you are going to demonstrate is that teachable spirit. A Christian has a T in the spelling of his time and because of that he is teachable and then the next I is influential influential you see a Christian is influential let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then they will glorify your father who is in heaven in fact the very desire and the goal and the dream of a real Christian is I want to influence other people I want Christ to influence me I want the light of Christ to shine upon me and then the light that is shining upon me. I want that to shine in the lives of other people. A Christian is influential and other people will even come to you and say praise the Lord for your life. Your life challenges me. Your life makes me to want to change. Your life want, makes me to want to go to the place you are going. A Christian, a real Christian is influential. A, a Christian is abiding. Abiding. It's not the one that is going out and coming in. It's not a caterpillar that you know, but today is there, tomorrow is not there. When you teach the word of God, and sometimes, you know, there are some people, they, they say, this is too tough and this is too hard. Who can hear this? And then the Bible says, and since that time, many of those people that were with Christ, they were no more with him. And Jesus said unto the rest of the people that remain, will you also go away? And then the real Christian, the real Christian, they were the people abiding, remaining. And they said, to whom shall we go? We are Christians. We are converted and we are holy and we are righteous, we are instructed, we are teachable and we are influential, we are abiding. To whom shall we go? If you are a real Christian, you will not say, ha, ha, this topic they are looking at today and they are reading the Bible in this area. I don't think I want to stay if that is what they are reading in the Bible. If you are a Christian, you'll abide, abide. You see, that is the characteristic of a real Christian. A Christian is abiding and then and he is nourished in the word of truth. A Christian is nourished in the word of truth. Maybe you have been wondering, are you a Christian? The question is, are you converted? Are you holy? Are you righteous? Are you instructed? Are you spiritual? Are you teachable? Are you influential? Are you abiding? Are you nourished in the word of truth? And tonight we want to look at the Christian man and the Christian woman. And we're looking at an area of the life of a Christian man. An area of the life of a Christian woman. And then what we have read, look at verse 3 again. It says, Who's adorning? Let it not be. That outward adorning and plating the air, and of wearing of gold, and of putting on of apparel. But let it be that hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. These verses reveal the characteristics and the qualities that mark out the spiritual condition of the professing Christian man or Christian woman. The text shows two sides of adornment. Number one, the outward adornment. Number two, the inward adornment. Number one, the external adornment. Number two, the internal adornment. And then tells us the hidden ornament of the meek and the quiet spirit. 
And then it tells us unconverted men and women put all their emphasis and they give all their attention to outward adornment with no interest at all and no commitment at all to spiritual inward adornment. On the other hand, the real Christian converted man converted woman the holy righteous child of god and the instructed and saintly spiritual child of god the teachable and the influential child of god the abiding and the nourished child of god that fellow concentrates on the cultivation and development of inward of the inward beauty of holiness with the corresponding outward cleanliness and appearance that please the lord the christian man or the christian woman whose desire and pursuit is to please god will not be conformed to this world let's look at romans chapter 12. in romans chapter 12 we're reading from verse 1 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Such a person will not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. We're told in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. Love not the world. This is the word to the Christian. Hey, you know, sometimes uh, when, when people hear that, they say, huh, this is tough for me. Well, it's not addressed to you if you are not a Christian. This is addressed to the Christian. Other people, sometimes you invite them for the first time to the church, and then they hear the word of God, they say, uh, that's too tough for me. Don't be hard on them. They are not born again yet. You say, yes, I understand. It will be tough for you. It's like telling, it's like telling a fish to fly. Until there's a transformation in your nature, you'll not be able to obey the word of God. Don't fight with yourself and don't blame yourself. If when we read all this and there's something you're asking, ah, I don't think I can do that. You are right. You cannot do it in your situation. You cannot do it in your condition. You cannot do it in your state of mind. Because you see, you need a conversion. You need to become a Christian. You need to become a child of God. And then the word of God will be switched to you. And the principles of the teaching of the word of God will be acceptable, agreeable, appreciated by you because now you are a child of God. You know, sometimes when we when we read the word of God, you come to church and say, Be ye holy for I am holy. Ah, you say that's tough. I cannot do that. I agree with you. It's talking to the children of God. It's only the children of God that hear the word of and they say, Praise the Lord. I want to be like my father who is in heaven. Praise the Lord. I want to have the nature. I want to have the character, the characteristics. I want to have the, uh, the, the attributes of my father who is in heaven. If you are not a child of God, when we read the word of God, you'll say, Ah, this is tough. I cannot do that. Now, let's hear this now. This is addressed to the children of God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. And the laws thereof, but he that doeth the will of God. Who are those people? Those are the Christians. And thank God I'm one of them. I said, thank God I'm one of them. He that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. Those are the people that abide forever. And I pray we're going to abide forever in Jesus' name. If your goal in dressing, if your goal in appearance, if your goal in apparel, if your goal in anything that you do is to please the world, you'll never be able to please God and you'll not be a child of God. It tells us in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of 
God. Now we're going to divide the study today. I'm sure you have an outline there. The topic we're dealing with today is spiritual adornment of godly women. I think we should say of godly men and women. Spiritual adornment of Christian men and women. And we divide the study to three parts. Number one, questionable appearance of so-called Christian women. Number two, the qualities of a truly spiritual woman. Number three, the quiet, uh, quietness of a transformed, submissive wife. We come to number one, questionable appearance of so-called, so-called Christian women. Uh, let's look at First Peter chapter. Let's uh, First Peter chapter three, verse three. First Peter chapter three, verse three. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the air and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. Here the apostle is actually pointing the attention of the believers to an example in the world, a portrait in the world. An idea in the world, the situation in the world. And he said, you who are Christian women, we should say Christian men together to you. Look at them. Or don't be like them. Who's that don't let it not be? Because you see the concentration of the people of the world is just dressing. It's just their appearance, the way they look. And everything is motivated by pride and vanity. The thing that dictates the mood and the manner of the outward adornment and dressing of those people in the world is the spirit of the age. And it is the God of this world that controls the fad and the fashion of the world. Christian women should distinguish themselves from the worldly. In fact, you see, Chris, uh, dressing tells a lot about who you are. Uh, let me show you in the Bible, let me show you this questionable appearance of so-called Christian women. And you will see why the Bible is jealously girding against you being like the people of the world. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. I'm reading from verse 14. Genesis chapter 38 verse 14 and she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which is by the way of Timnath and to Timnath for she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife and when Judah saw her she thought when Judah saw her, she thought. When Judah saw her, she saw she thought her to be an harlot. And then he gives the reason because she had covered her face. Now you will see then the attire, the apparel, the appearance actually gives you a way, and they will say, Ah, that is such and such. That is so and so. I want you to look at verse 21. In verse 21 it says, Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. You see, it was the dressing, it was the appearance of that lady that made Judah to feel this is an harlot. And what the Lord is telling us is, let us distinguish you, let us know who you are. Don't allow yourself to be classified with the people of the world. That's why it says, who's a done it, let it not be like they do in the world. Let's come to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 16. Exodus chapter 2 verse 16, now the, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and filled the trust to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and held them and watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. 
Here's another situation again. They had never met Moses. You see, there are many people that have never met you. They have never seen you. We know you. You profess to be born again. You say you are a child of God. Yes, it's a Christian family. And how many weeks have we been together? How many years have we been together? But the people out there, there are people who are seeing you for the first time. And they're going to evaluate you. They're going to classify you with some people. Here came Moses. Of course, you know Moses. Moses was not an Egyptian. In fact, he demonstrated he was not an Egyptian by killing that Egyptian and defending the Israelites. This was a real Israelite, an Israelite indeed, but he didn't know because of her dressing. Her appearance, his appearance gave him away as if he were, he were an Egyptian. That's why they said an Egyptian helped us. What the Lord is telling us is the way you dress, the way you appear, let it not be like the people they see in the world. We're looking at Sephaniah chapter 1. Uh, it's near the end of the Old Testament. Sephaniah. In Sephaniah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Sephaniah chapter 1 verse 8. And it shall come to pass in that day, in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, that I will punish the princes, and the king's children, and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. And God the Almighty said, Prophet, go and tell them. If they are telling you that it doesn't matter how we appear, it doesn't matter whether people classify us with the harlots and with the prostitutes and, you know, the people of the world. Go and tell them it matters because the day is coming when I will punish the princes and I will punish the children of those kings as many as are clothed with strange apparel. By the way, what kind of a dressing is the Lord telling us to avoid as we look at the principles of scripture? Number one, strange apparel strange apparel how do you define strange something that looks not quite common not quite acceptable not quite agreeable not quite appropriate as you see that, that this thing doesn't look appropriate for a Christian, doesn't look acceptable for a Christian, doesn't look agreeable to a Christian spirit, number one, strange. Number two, seductive and sensual dressing. Seductive and sensual dressing. That is a kind of dressing that seduces other people. It's like, you know, we're talking about the dressing, the attire, the appearance, the apparel of a harlot. It's seductive. It's uh, making people to feel they should go in the wrong direction and commit immorality. It makes their thoughts, the thoughts of the men that see those women, it makes their thoughts go the wrong direction. Number three, suggestive dressing. Suggestive. That means revealing. You know, sometimes you know, a lady is a dress and the thing is so tight, that's very, very suggestive. It may be tight on the upper area, very, very suggestive. Or it may be like, you know, it is loose and, you know, when they bend down it's very very suggestive or sometimes it's like you know it's, it's a very suggestive very tight in the buttocks area and you know it's very very suggestive that's what the Lord is saying that's strange that's strange and if you're a child of God number one strange number two seductive and sensual number three suggestive number four sodomite sodomite you see there are people today when you see them, they declare who they are. They are sodomites, they are lesbians. And, it, you know, those men, they have a kind of effeminate appearance. And that kind of sodomite appearance, you don't want to be classified with Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to distance yourself, distinguish yourself, say, no, I am a Christian, I am a child of God. And when you stand side by side with them, the people will be able to say the difference is clear. If the difference is not clear, you are not dressed as a Christian. If a Christian, a child of God stands by, by the side of a harlot and the difference is not clear. If a child of God stands uh, by, side by side with Sodomite, a lesbian, and there's no difference and the difference is not clear, how are they going to tell that you are a child of God? Number one, strange. Number two, seductive and sensual. Number three, suggestive. Number four, Sodomite and CC, effeminate. Number five, soiled. Soiled, soiled. Uh, let me show you in Jude, Jude verse, uh, uh, verse 23. 
In Jude verse 20, there's a kind of garment, there's a kind of dressing that is soiled. And look at it in Jude verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hitching even the garment spotted, soiled by the flesh. And young people need to understand this. You know, sometimes if you look at a particular dress, about 10 years ago, it was all right. About 20 years ago, that kind of dress would be all right. But, you know, the people that are maybe gangsters, or maybe the people that are on the negative side of life, or the people that are, you know, drug addicts, they've taken that dress. It was good 20 years ago, but now they have put their own stamp on it. And then everybody that had sees that dress now, which was all right 20 years ago, when they see that dress now, they classify it with the adornment and the apparel of this class of people. That dress is soiled. It's soiled. They are stained and spotted that dress by who they are. And you are a child, and if you see that kind of dress on you, they are going to, ah, oh, it's one of them. Because it's no more 20 years ago. Now we're talking of the present day. Therefore, number five, soiled. Number six, sinful sinful anything that you know will, 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 will lead other people to sin that's a sinful appearance that's a sinful dress and then number seven satanic satanic you see what in the world is satanic dressing there are some occultic people that have their kind of uniform and uh, you know if you are let's say you're on the campus for example any of our campuses here in nigeria i don't know about many other countries but you see there are sometimes you wear a dress and then somebody is making a sign to you and then you're ignorant you are not making the sign then it comes to say uh, don't are you not part of our cult are you not part of then he'll mention oh you say no then why are you wearing this dress go, go and remove it because that is our dress they'll tell you you see there are some dresses that are cultic and satanic is that uh, is that new to in this world let me show you in second kings chapter 10 second kings chapter 10 you see the cultic uh, the occultic people those in secret societies they have their own kind of dressing and you want to clear away from their uh, from their company from their group in uh, second kings chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 21 Second Kings chapter 10, verse 21. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto, and he said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth the vestments, the garments, the robes for all the worshippers of Baal and he brought them forth vestments. You see it was a kind, it was a special kind of dressing for those Baal worshippers. Idol worshippers have their kind of dressing and the satanic people, the occultic people have their kind of dressing and you don't want to just, sometimes you know some of our sisters will just pick up a catalog and then as they look, that, uh, look at the catalog they say I like this style, I like this style then they tell the tailor, the seamstress they say sew this for me and they, if the tailor wants to help you, if the seamstress wants to help you and it's this, uh, why do you want this kind of I like this style and then the seamstress might tell you but this is the kind of dress that these kind of people wear oh you say I didn't know that I'm, I'm glad you told me you know sometimes we don't know how some people uh, do their things some of our young people over there uh, you see a young man and he's going on the street he has a uh, earring a man on the one, one ear the other ear does not have earring and you don't understand you don't know that it's a symbol a symbol of this group and class of people and sometimes you'll find a man that weaves the air uh, you know like uh, if you were in the village uh, many years ago you you see those idol worshippers and you see the men they weave the air it was the symbol of those idol worshippers and sometimes when our young people see that they say 
Hey, I, I like that. Looks like this man is tough. No, he's not tough. He belongs to a particular class. And if you do that kind of thing, they classify you with them. And, uh, you know, there are some other times, too, that you will see how some, you know, people, or it may be just a line they, they put on a particular, on their trusses and say, this is, this is cheek. This is, this is beautiful. I want this. Then you take your dress to the, uh, to the seams or the tailor and say, do this for me. And he looks at you and says, but I thought you were deeper life. Yes, I'm still deeper life. I'm, you know, uh, I don't miss any meeting there. Why do you want to put this on your dress? I just like it. It's just colorful. And then the tailor would, it's not just colorful. It belongs to a particular class. That's why we're learning. Because, you know, if we're not learning, we'll get into many mistakes in this life. And uh, thank God, we're children of God. Amen. We will not fall. And we will stay as we are. In fact, you know, sometimes I'm challenged by, you know, some of these people who are not a Christians at all. They, when they want to appear a particular way, they belong to a particular class. They are proud of the class they belong to. They are proud of the society and the clique and the group they belong to. And then we who are Christians, why is it that he's a Christian that is not, you know, proud of where he is? And it's not happy that I am a Christian. This is my class I pray you stay in your class and so we have these uh, people that have questionable appearance and by the grace of God we're not going to join them in Jesus name we're well, looking at Deuteronomy chapter 22 Deuteronomy chapter 22 I'm reading from verse 5 Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God it's so very clear it has two parts there and in the major parts of the world, almost every part of the world, everybody keeps to one part of that verse. The part they keep to is that a man shall not put on that which belongs to a woman. Almost everywhere you go today, even whether it's in the west or in the south or Africa or Asia or America, the women, you know, the men do not put on a men's apparel. You know, if any man appears and then he's wearing, you know, up and down or the normal dress of the woman. You know, sometimes uh, there are some people that dress in some funny ways and they want to get to the aeroplane. And then the uh, officials, the hostesses will just call uh, the security people and then they just say, excuse me, can we have your attention? And, and he doesn't know then the whisk came away. And then he says the plane is going to say you cannot go with that plane because you are not correct. Why am I not correct? Don't you have liberty? No, you are a man and you are putting on women's apparel. If we believe one part of the verse, how do we console the other part of the verse that says a woman shall not put on that which belongs to a man and then it says all that do so are abomination in the sight of the lord you will not go into that abominable thing in second kings chapter 9 verse 30 second kings chapter 9 verse 30 and when jehu was come to jezreel jezebel had of it and she painted her face and and tied her head and looked out at a window I wonder why today people do not, uh, people act like Jezebel, but they don't want to answer the name Jezebel. If you, for example, found a woman that paints the face and then tied the hair like this woman did, and then it's, oh, good morning, Mrs. J, Miss Jezebel. They say, why do you call me Jezebel? Oh, I thought you were. Oh, no, I'll never be Jezebel, but you are one already. You see, there are people, they don't understand. They act like Judas. They don't want to bear the name Judas. They act like Achan. They don't want you to call them Achan. Let's call this page this page. If you appear like Jezebel, why shouldn't we call you Jezebel? If being called a Jezebel is very offensive to you, then change your appearance and change your attitude and be dignified. You know, sometimes a teacher, a class teacher comes to the class. And then when the teacher comes to the class, he creates a lady. And then the children, they are all giggling and laughing and saying, look at her, look at her. And then one of them might say, 
against Jezebel. And then one of those said, children be bold enough to speak loud and say, Jezebel. And then the teacher will look her back and then they close their mouth and they laugh and all that. And then the teacher gets offended, goes to the principal. These children don't respect me. You want to be respectable? Appear respectable. You want to be dignified, appear dignified. You know, it is not, it's not that those children, yes, those children are not here and they are, they are bad, but the children is what they saw. It's the picture they saw. They are putting a label on the picture they saw. If you want to have the respect of the children and the respect of your community, dress in a respectable way and dress in an, in an acceptable manner and they'll not be calling you Jezebel. I pray change one come we're looking at jeremiah chapter 4 verse 30 jeremiah chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 30 jeremiah chapter 4 reading verse 30 it says and when thou art spoiled what wilt thou do though thou clothest thyself with crimson Though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, and though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fear, thy lovers will despise thee, and they will seek thy life. If you have been listening to the news anywhere in the world, you'll discover that rape is higher today than it was 50 years ago. You know, 50 years, in fact, what are we talking about? Just about 20 years ago, if anybody wanted to, you know, as we close and you are going anywhere, ladies just walk alone. They walk anywhere. If there is no bus, you are the bus stop and you're looking at your time. Time is going. It looks like the bus will not come in time. The lady will just be walking by herself and no man will touch her. You know why? She was dressed correctly and the ladies were dressed correctly at that time. Right now, it's very difficult for ladies to just walk alone like that because rape has become something terrible is expanding is destroying almost the whole community and it's because of the dressing it's because of the appearance that's what the bible is saying that when you paint yourself like this and you have this do and that other appearance what will you do when you become spoiled when they spoil your life and they spoil your career and you know sometimes uh, today uh, you go to our campuses or you go to even our secondary school, they wear the you know the children don't want to wear uniform anymore because the uniform doesn't make them to have the liberty that they want and just dress anyhow. And uh, you know some of those teachers now, those ladies, those girls, they turn their heads because of their parents. They rape them, they destroy them, and they destroy their future. And it's just because of their parents. That's why the Lord is saying, for those of us who are Christians, who are children of God, we are going to be different I said we're going to be different and don't you be ashamed don't let anybody make you feel ashamed that you are dressing as a Christian we are going to influence our community I come to point number two point number two now qualities <coughs> the qualities of a truly spiritual woman the qualities of a truly spiritual woman when <coughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. In First Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Of great price. Now, for a Christian, how does this work out? For example, when you become a Christian, number one, there's a desire in your heart. A desire. You see, as a child of God, you want to really be influential in this world in which you are. You want to turn things around in the world in which you are. And it's not just about, do I look uh, this or do I look that? It's not, what influence do I want to have on the people that know me? What impact do I want to have on the people that associate with me? Therefore, number one, there's a desire. Number two, there's a decision. You are telling yourself, I know that if I go this direction, I will not influence people. 
If I go this other direction, my life will not have an impact on them. And my appearance, the appearance of the man is very, very important. And therefore, number one, there's a desire. Number two, there's a decision. Number three, there's a demand. You, are going, you go to the Lord and you demand abundant grace from the Lord. You demand mercy from the Lord. You demand more of the nature of the Lord. That means prayer. That means you are asking the Lord, Oh Lord, in this single life in which I'm living, I want to have a good influence around, on the people around me. Uh, can I talk to our Christian uh, workers and our you know, Christian uh, leaders? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are some of our women leaders. Uh, you know, you might be a coordinator. You might be the wife of a pastor. And you are not thinking about what influence do you want to have. You just think, well, I have my liberty. Well, everybody has liberty too. But what kind of, how do you want to use that liberty? And sometimes what kind of influence do you want to have on your child, on your daughters, on the young people, on the youths in the church? What kind of influence do you want to have? It's not just about, well, I like this dressing, I want to be like this. The question is, what kind of influence do I want to have? And let me ask you, when you see a soldier, a soldier has a kind of appearance, a kind of uniform. A soldier has a kind of air court. Because he's a soldier. When you see a policeman, a policeman has a kind of air court. A policeman has a kind of dressing, a kind of appearance. Because we associate that dressing with discipline, with the lifestyle of the policeman. When you see a medical doctor, a medical doctor has an appearance. It's not just about the knowledge of medicine. You know, if you went to, if you went to an hospital and then they said, okay, wait there, the, uh, the receptionist says, uh, you know, sign this card and you sign the card and then it says, what do you want? I want to see the doctor. And then somebody comes out, and this man, you know, he weaves the air and he's, he dresses like, uh, you know, uh, one of some of those footballers you see on the billboard. And uh, then you say, this, this one, did he come as a patient or who is this? Oh, they say that's the doctor and he's the one going to operate on you. you say, excuse me, I'll check out. Uh, give me my card. I don't, I don't want to put my name in this place. Because you see, a doctor has an appearance that makes us to respect and accept and put value on his medicine, medical profession. And then an engineer has, you know, has a kind of appearance. A professor, you go to a university and then they say, that's the vice chancellor. The way he carries himself and the way he dresses and the way he appears, you say, yes, I believe that must be a professor. If another person comes, and then you know the ear dew and the ear ring and you know the the shorts and all that and they say that's the professor the the, uh, the the vice chancellor of the whole university you say what that cannot be now uh, the president of a country has an appearance of any country and if you find the president of a country and then he scrapes you know the whole ear and he leaves uh, something on top here and then they say look at the president of a you say which country is that that country must be a country of rascals. You, you, you understand? You see, if you want to influence people as a lady, if you want to influence people as a woman leader, your appearance, your dressing, your apparel, it's everything. It's not just the doctrine you know. It's not just the title you have, but the appearance that you have. And then when we see you, we say, yes, that should be one of our Christian leaders. Yes, that should be one of the, you know, wives of uh, uh, the, the important uh, leaders and pastors in this church the quality is not what you have number one you have a desire i want to influence people in the right direction number two there's a decision number three there's demand number four there's deliverance deliverance what kind of deliverance is this look at galatians chapter one galatians chapter one i'm reading from verse four galatians chapter one verse four who gave himself for our sins 
who gave himself for our sins. And then it says that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. You know, if you have a, if you have a liking for, you know, the, the appearance of the world, you need deliverance in that area. I don't mean the kind of deliverance those other people are talking about. You need to go to Christ and say, Lord, take this kind of taste away from my heart. Take this kind of desire, propensity, leaning away from my heart to be delivered from the, uh, from the things of this present world. Number five is dedication. You bring your body, you bring your life, you bring everything upon the altar and say, Lord, I dedicate myself afresh to you. I yield myself afresh to you. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1, I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's dedication. You see, you are not going to do anything with your body, which is not according to the will of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And then in that dedication, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 and 32. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, whether you are dressing or or you are having an hairstyle, air due, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. What are you trying to do by that kind of air due? Are you glorifying yourself? Are you attracting people to yourself? Are you, are you wanting people to say, hey, she said, nice, she's beautiful, she's this or that. Or what is your intention? Do you want to attract people to Christ? You know, there are some things that you can do that to attract people to Christ and they will not think about you. Of course, if you are, you know, if you dress very poor, it will be, they will be attracted to you too. If you dress almost naked, they will be attracted to you too. If you dress like a beggar, they are going to be attracted to you too. If you dress like, you know, somebody who does not have, you know, all the senses correct, as people are passing, they will be looking back at you. That's a negative kind of attraction. On the other hand, if you dress like a prostitute or you dress like people who wants to draw other people to sin, they'll be looking at you too, but you stay in the middle. You stay in the middle, you are presentable and you are nice and you are neat and you know everything is appropriate and then you are attracting people unto the Lord. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Neither give offense to the Jews or to the Gentiles. Oh, to the church of God. And you know there are some uh, uh, women in our church, they don't mind whether they cause offense or not. They don't mind whether the you know, pastor who labors over them day and night for many years, they don't mind whether that pastor is you know, happy about uh, what they do or not. They don't worry whether the preachers are happy about what they do or not. They, and they even say, I don't care, I don't care. You say, you know, the, the pastor may not like this. What do I care about what the pastor likes, what the pastor does not like? They can even deliberately be an offense to the leadership of the church. That's not right. You see, if we have the grace of God in us, you want to be grateful. You want to be appreciative that this pastor, this leader is teaching us the word of God. And he never acts as if he's tired. He might run up and down, yet he will come and then he will teach us the word of God. We have to pay back this man with obedience and with submission and with saying, well, I'm going to make him happy that his life is fulfilled. His teaching is important and that we're accepting and receiving even everything is teaching us, but you know, if you're an offense, offense to everybody, offense to our youths. And the children, you know, we try to correct the young people, and the young people said, hey, but look at mama so-and-so. 
Look at Madam so and so. Look at Sister so and so. Look at women coordinators so and so. You are not face to the youth section because now we cannot teach the youth section and lead them in the right direction because they are saying, You are telling us, How old am I? I'm just 16. I'm just 17. And the people that have been our church for more than 20 years before I was born, look at what they are doing. You are not face, but you want to repent of that and say, Lord, what's motivating me? What's driving me? What am I looking for? Why am I in the church and I don't care about the negative influence I have on other people in the church? Giving no offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And then number six is determination. Determination from today, from what I'm listening to today, from what I'm learning today, I will not be an offense. I'm going to be an encouragement to the church and I'm going to follow the teachings and the principles of scripture. And then number seven is discipline. Discipline. You discipline yourself by the grace of God. And what is important to you will be the, the, the nature of Christ within you. While natural men and natural women concentrate on beautifying the body. God desires the purity of our hearts. The holy and the purified heart is of great importance to the Christian man, to the Christian woman. Without a holy heart, a pure heart, none can see God and none can get to heaven and live with God in eternity. That's the reason why the priority of the Christian man, the priority of the Christian woman should be the maintenance of pure hearts rather than having an outward appearance which attracts the worldly minded to him or to her to have a pure heart we must be born again this experience of the new birth is obtained by repenting of all known sins and turning to christ for forgiveness and salvation with such a genuine conversion there will be a definite visible change of life and such change in the christian man the christian woman will be transforming the attitude of an individual like that will you transform our interests and transform our desires, our taste, our dressing, our appearance, and relationship with the husband or the wife at home. With consecration and prayer and faith, you will seek the face of God for sanctification and purity of heart. The possession, not profession, the possession not proclamation, the possession of holiness and a pure heart is of greater value to you as a Christian woman than the praise of all men in the world. You would rather miss the commendation, the appreciation, the praise of all men than lose the experience of sanctification. That experience of sanctification is what Peter is talking about. Let it be the hidden man of the heart which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of god is of great price and this is what the lord has promised he'll do for us if you look at ezekiel chapter 36 ezekiel chapter 36 reading from verse 26 in your heart also will i give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And what a glorious day when that happens to every one of us. That the stony heart is taken away. The stubborn heart is taken away. The self-will is taken away. And then God gives us the submissive and simple and soft heart of flesh we're told in matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 8 matthew chapter 5 verse 8 the lord himself tells us blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god this is what is praiseworthy in the sight of the lord romans chapter 2 verse 29 romans chapter 2 Verse 29, but he that he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 22 through to verse 24. In First Thessalonians 
5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. The appearance that, you know, appears to be evil, the attire, the dressing, that appears to be evil, that will make people classify you with those who are strange, with those who are sensual, that will make people classify you with those who are sodomites. You want to abstain from every appearance of evil. And then it says in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. The Lord will do it for us. And it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14. As obedient children, what kind of children should we be? Tell me out loud. As obedient children, I'm going to ask you a question. Since we've been coming, we've been learning quite a lot. And, uh, you know, if somebody were to tell you, I went to a particular uh, conference uh, I think it was last month. It was actually a youth conference in Europe. And, um, you know, some of those children have been listening to me and because the Bible study also gets to London, Manchester, Liverpool, and, and uh, also in the Leeds, uh, where I was uh, just this last week. We went to this uh, youth conference. And then they told those uh, young people, they divided them into groups. And he told them to write something about uh, their general superintendents. And, you know, those groups of children, they wrote uh, quite a lot. Some of them went on the internet, they went to search, and they read quite a lot of materials. And uh, before they finished that youth conference, uh, they wrote some things about me. Uh, compo it's like composition, but it's like writing a uh, biography. And then those people said they were not going to mark it, that, uh, you know, they knew I was busy because I was preaching to them there, gave a message. And and then counsel and then give another message but they still wanted me to you know go back to my teaching profession and grade all those uh, papers and i got all those papers and you know I'm i read some things i said these young people way far away in europe how did they know all this about the general superintendent you know uh, one of the write-up was so good and was so great i gave uh, you know that a uh, group i gave them a plus another one i gave them a another one a minus i think it's only one group that got a B because those people really wrote. Then I thought, looks like all these people know me very well and they know the doctrine, they know what I teach and they know that, you know, the Bible from cover to cover. But then the question I'm asking is, if I were to ask you, what do you think the pastor is teaching? You say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then without going back to your notes, to you say this is what he's teaching. What is the word of God teaching us according to, you know, the pastor, the Lord has given you what's he teaching on dressing you say one two three four and you know run through everything my question to you is if you know that that is what the pastor is teaching in the word of god are you obeying it are you carrying it out what change is going to be in your lifestyle in your approach in your dressing in your appearance as a result of the bible study we have tonight are we going to come the fall next sunday and next monday and still be like you know the old kind of people as obedient children you see that's the kind of children we ought to be that's the kind of members we ought to have that we know that this is what our leader our pastor and our teacher is teaching us and this is what is going to make the heart of almighty god glad as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i I am holy. We will be holy. Amen. I said we're going to be holy. Amen. And the Lord himself is telling us that this is the way to live. And by the grace of God, we're going to live that way. I come to point number three, quietness. The quietness of a transformed, submissive wife. The quietness of a transformed, submissive wife. We look at 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4 again. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, 
Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That, that's, that's a glorious sin. That's a beautiful sin. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. How does a quiet spirit manifest itself in the family, in the home? How does a, a meek and quiet spirit, how do you see that? How is it revealed? How can you recognize this is a quiet and a meek spirit? Number one, in your temper and temperament. In your temper and temperament. You see, if you have that quiet spirit, you'll not be boisterous, noisy, lousy, aggressive. You see, if you have quiet and, and, and meek spirit, it will manifest in your temper, in your temperament. Number two, in your thoughtfulness, in your thoughtfulness. You'll be very, a thoughtful woman, a meditative woman. And you will not just, you'll not be talking before you think. You'll think before you talk. You'll think before you act. You'll think before you react. You'll think before you respond. In Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. Luke chapter 2 verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And that's a quiet spirit. That's a meek spirit. You're very thoughtful. Number one is in your temper and temperament. Number two is in your thoughtfulness. Number three is your tenderness. Tenderness. You know, if you're meek, you'll be tender. If you're quiet, you'll be tender. If you're very thoughtful of other people, considerate of people in the family, your husband, your children, your pastor, your church, you'll be very tender. And number four, how do you recognize a person of a quiet spirit? A quiet spirit, a solemn spirit, a meek spirit. Number four, on the tongue, on the talk, on the way they talk. And sometimes it's not just that you're talking something bad. You know, sometimes uh, I, I we come to the church, and we say we're giving testimony, and uh, so a sister will come in, and then the way she comes in, her posture, and we have to have quiet spirit, a mixed spirit, and then the way she takes that microphone, and then she begins to talk, and then the brother who is moderating will be saying, you know, three minutes. It's done for, she's done five minutes already and then the brother is saying sister three minutes three minutes you know you've gone beyond and then she said actually you know and then she she fires on and then she shouts and then she looks at her she looks at the man and say please don't hinder me don't disturb me I, I'm, I'm going to tell my testimony I want I've been waiting for a long time to tell this testimony I, don't say you are moderate or I'm having the microphone and let me talk and then you know everybody is saying then the whole church is laughing and the church is you know uh, all the ch uh, that interests the children they say look at this woman if this woman is doing like this to their local pastor here how is the woman doing at home you know if you're going to have that quiet spirit and the mixed spirit it will affect your tongue the way you talk when you ought to keep quiet when you ought to speak and even the things you say, how you say them, the way you come out and the way you relate to the people, number five, is trust, trust. You know, those who are quiet and meek, they are trusting and they are trustworthy too. You know, they are not going to say anything until they think it through. And then on our tolerance, tolerance, you are not, uh, you know, a boisterous type, aggressive type. And, you know, uh, you want to, you know, pull the whole house down because something it's not a going the right direction with you. Number seven is thankfulness. Thankfulness of a quiet and meek spirit. You are very thankful. Oh, thank you very much. And my husband, I appreciate this. Thank you for this. And children, thank you for putting those things away right there. You are very, very thankful. You are not a person that just takes everybody for granted. Whatever they do for you and whatever happens in the family, never say thank you. That has a good spirit. And then when you have a quiet spirit, spirit number one no argument no argument you, you come into a home and you never hear any argument you know what's happening in that family there's a 
quiet and a beautiful spirit there. Number two, no accusation. No accusation. You know, sometimes you are hearing from the other room, from the other house, as they're accusing one another, throwing words at one another. No accusation. Number three, no anger, no annoyance. And when we have a quiet spirit and a mixed spirit, there's no anger, there's no annoyance. We just live our lives, husband and wife, and parents and children. There's a beautiful spirit in that family. And then number four, no anxiety. No anxiety. Worried, anxious, talking and, you know, shouting and all that. You don't find that where there's a quiet and mixed spirit. And then number five, no arrogance. Uh, the, the woman may be working in a place that brings in more money in the family. And the woman is not, you know, always, you know, feeling proud. I'm the one supporting this family. You man, there's nothing you are doing. There's a beautiful spirit that is quiet and meek. And then number number six, no attacks and no abuse. No attacks and no abuse. You know, arrows of words that fly in some families. And in those uh, families, if you hear the wife talk to the husband, it's like throwing a javelin. It's like throwing an arrow, a dagger into the heart of that man. You know, there are some words that women speak, although you might even say sorry after that. Maybe something, something happens and uh, you say, oh, please, be very careful. Don't treat me like your father treated your mother. Okay, I'm sorry I said that. That man may not forget that for the next one year. That's an arrow. That's a dagger in the heart of that man. There's no attack and there's no abuse. There's no insult. When the woman has a quiet spirit and a meek spirit, and then number seven, there's no anarchy. Anarchy is, you know, when everybody is lord of himself. The man is talking, the woman is talking, the children are shouting, everybody is screaming, and uh, you know, law and order has broken down, and nobody wants to listen to anybody in that family. That's anarchy. You see, where there's a quiet spirit and a mixed spirit, there's no, there's no argument, there's no accusation, there's no anger, there's no annoyance, there's no anxiety, there's no arrogance, there's no attack, no abuse, and there's no anarchy. The Lord has taught us today, as the Lord has taught us today, and now what we need to do is to take it to the Lord in person. Oh Lord, this is what we want to be. I want to have a good influence on my community. I want to be a real Christian. And that means I want to show that conversion experience and that holiness and that righteousness and that instruction. I want to be spiritual, not carnal. I want to be teachable. I want to be properly instructed and influenced. I want to be an abiding Christian, nourished in the word of truth. Let's rise up up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we have heard your word again today and we want to be the men you want us to be. We want to be the women you want us to be. The Lord will help us and check up on your Christian experience. If you're a Christian, then it means you are converted. Are you really converted? Are you truly converted? Is there a change, a transformation in your life? If you're a Christian, it means you are holy and humble. Would you truly say you are holy and humble? Pride is foreign to the Christian. Arrogance is foreign to the Christian. If you are a Christian, it means that you are a real child of God, converted, holy, humble, righteous, and redeemed. And you are renewed in your heart, your life. It means you are instructed. It means you are spiritual and not carnal. You are teachable. You are teachable. You don't reject the teaching of the word of God. And you have a good influence. You are salt in your family. You are salt in the earth. An abiding Christian nourished in the word of truth. Check up your wardrobe. Check up the attire, the apparel, the things you put on your ear do your appearance is it strange or seductive sensual is it suggestive too revealing tempting effeminate and sodomite is it stained spotted 
soiled by the class of people that wear that kind of clothes is this sinful a man wearing that which belongs to women a woman wearing that which belongs to men is it satanic is it occultic is it idolatrous it what is it you pray and tell the lord that today you want to have a desire to be a real christian the desire to appear every time like a christian then have a decision and demand grace from the lord lord grant me your grace to be an obedient child an obedient brother an obedient sister deliver me from the spirit of the age the spirit of the age is a spirit of rebellion is a spirit of anarchy the spirit of confusion dedicate yourself lay everything on the altar determined to follow the lord daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself tell the lord to grant you a good measure of self-discipline that your spirit will be that quiet peaceable mixed spirit if you have not been saved give your life to the lord and be saved if you find that sanctification is missing pray and tell the lord sanctify me my spirit my heart my body 